Hi there guys and welcome to this Thursday episode of the Cryptoverse. The Cryptoverse is your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. My name is Chris Coney, I am the host of the Cryptoverse and also the founder of Cryptoversity.com, which is the online school where you set the price to learn about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And you can find out more at Cryptoversity.com. By going to the podcast page, you can subscribe to the Cryptoverse on any of your favorite channels, including iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Store, YouTube, and Steemit. If you'd like to support the Cryptoverse, please click through to Steemit, vote for this episode, or support us directly by sending us a tip to the Bitcoin address on that page. So let's start off with a market roundup, as always. Not really much to see here this morning. Um, One thing I'll say is that Steam has lost another 13.5%, so it's really been having some heavy heavy declines these last few days. If I just dig into the chart here a little bit, um, the, it, the market cap of Steam peaked at, on the 19th of July, I think it was, and it was around f- well, 400, oh, it was 20th of July, 404 million. Uh, so that was, well, less than, it was like three weeks ago, or two or three weeks ago. And it's had a steady decline since then. And now it's, you know, it's, it's back to where it was mm, to 12th of July. So in a month, it went from 130 million to 404 million, and then back down to what what it is now 100. And, what is it right now? Uh, 175 million, which is puzzling to me because um, they're adding new users all the time. Like that site I mentioned, Steamly, is it Steamly? S T whoops, I'm gonna press enter. S T E E M L E, yeah, Steamly. dot com. If you go to the charts section, uh, I was looking at number of account creations per day, and yesterday, the tenth of August, they added another one thousand six hundred and fifty-five accounts, and that's pretty normal for them now. Um, that isn't a huge number, like I said the other day, compared to the other social networks. But it is an increase in demand gradually. So maybe it was just the hype surrounding the fact that they um, got discovered by the masses uh, or, or the crypto community at large. And then maybe a lot of traders rushed in and and now are cashing out. I don't really know. There's nothing fundamental that I can see wrong with Steam that's causing that. But we'll, we'll keep an eye on it nonetheless. I'm going to keep my Steam in the network. I've already vested it anyway. So... It doesn't really matter to me what the price does now. So moving on, not much to say about the two Ethereums. They're they're both down today, but the gap is still pretty big. Uh, The gap's about $800 800 million in market cap. The only two coins in the top 10, other than Bitcoin, that have gained today are Dash and Nenem. I think Dash was announced as a... It's been integrated with a point of sale system so that was I'm not saying that the news is the cause but that's good news for Dash other than that pretty boring in the top 20 right now so let's move on Uh, in terms of the Bitcoin price chart we're still sat under that 600 pound 600 pound I always said 600 dollar mark now yesterday we did touch above it the highest price yesterday was 603 dollars but by the end of the day it come back down again and closed at 590 and 591 is where we're sitting right now. So let's, it's, it's getting closer. I mean, the lows, the low prices of each day are gradually creeping up by the looks of things. And if we can break that 600, then we'll, we'll be back on the rise, I imagine. Okay, in terms of the news today, I picked this article out first from Bitcoin.com. It's an article by John Southhurst. And the article is, Colombia's first Bitcoin exchange has been closed by regulators. Now, when I read that, I haven't read the whole article yet because I'm going to comment on it as I read it with you. But to me, that's disgusting. You know, just, that just upsets me, the idea of that. So the first Bitcoin exchange in Colombia called Colbitex, which opened just two weeks ago, has gone offline, apparently due to legal issues with digital currency in the country. Okay, so the first thing I'll say already is that while the headline kind of made, upset me, it doesn't necessarily mean that 
it says closed by regulators. So immediately you think, oh, the regulators, they're, they're, they're trying to stop Bitcoin. Well, that might not be true. It might be that there are some fair regulations and the exchange didn't satisfy them, <laughs> in which case the closure would be completely legitimate. But that remains to be seen. Let's see what the article says. So Colbitex goes offline. Spanish language cryptocurrency news site Di Diario Bitcoin reported the closure is a temporary measure while the company and regulators determine the legal framework under which it may operate, if at all. Mm -hmm. At present, Colbitex's website is offline with users directed instead to a basic support page to submit fund withdrawal requests. Local financial regulator, the Super Inter... Super Intend... The Super Intendencia Financeria de Colombia. Excuse my terrible uh, Spanish accent there. Permits only transactions that have a Colombian peso equivalent. Okay. Oh, right, that's the problem, and they haven't decided what the peso equivalent is, I suppose. But they can, because they need an exchange to establish a market price, don't they? Since Bitcoin is not considered a real currency, quote, there, there can be no official exchange rate. Colbitex's support page notes that the regulator had not explicitly banned the use of Bitcoin in Colombia, but in May 2016, they had issued a warning, along with the central bank, Banco de uh, Banco de la República de Colombia about the risks associated with using digital currencies. So they're saying, what's the problem? They're, um, right, because okay, the problem is because they don't recognize Bitcoin as a real currency, they can't have an official exchange rate, and that's the problem. But like I was just saying, the way you establish a market price of an exchange rate is through an exchange that allows the market to decide, okay? So shutting the exchange down isn't the answer, in my opinion. The answer is to declare that Bitcoin is a currency, right, and that's it. And then the exchange can operate, a market price can be established, and off we go. So the the core of the problem is that the regulators have not classed Bitcoin as a real currency. That's kind of where the bugaboo is. So, um, the, I say the Central Bank of Colombia they previously issued a warning about the use of digital currencies, and it says the boilerplate risk warning has been repeated by those central banks and financial regulators around the world since the beginning of 2014. Yeah, when it, I think boilerplate, by boilerplate they mean like templated, standardized um, message that they send out about warning the public about this dangerous thing called cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin taking root in Colombia. Colbatex had proved popular with locals, recording 103.5 million Colombian pesos in transaction volumes on, the August, on August the 6th, which is 34,528 US dollars. Colbatex had been operating in test mode since opening for business on July the 25th, though co-founder Roman Parra had said in an earlier interview that the exchange complied with all the appropriate legal, tax and commercial laws and its initial test period was for customers to familiarize themselves with the concept of trading Bitcoin. The company offered the only Bitcoin exchange for Colombian peso holders with limit and market orders and online wallet storage. Meanwhile, statistics from peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchange Local Bitcoins have shown an increasing trading activity in the country, which is a pretty good sign of a growing demand. Well, there we go. Local Bitcoins is kind of a... Um, a market-to-market, peer-to-peer exchange, isn't it? So Bitcoin's growing pains in South America. Para also stated that Bitcoin growth in Colombia had been slow compared to neighboring countries like Argentina and Venezuela, but that he had high hopes for the exchange to expand into other markets and offer trading in other assets. A report in March of this year claimed that the two men had been, or two men had been arrested in Venezuela for mining bitcoins, though the arrest may instead have been triggered by associated tax issues that, than the act of mining itself. Yeah, that's a similar problem. It's not necessarily that it was declared illegal, it's just that it wasn't declared legal, if that makes any sense. It's like, well, we haven't classified mining as a thing yet, so um, you're earning income 
you know, from something we can't tax. Well, well then, <laughs> if you don't declare that it is taxable, by default it isn't, I would say, and therefore no tax is owed. And if that's a problem for the authorities, then get your ass moving and um, write a law that declares the act of mining or currency as a, as a, a what is it in law? You know, give it a give it a give it a classification so we can get back to business. Venezuela has at least one online Bitcoin exchange, uh, Sur Bitcoin, uh, Sur Bitcoin, still operating, although it has also closed temporarily last month after a local banking partner froze its fiat fiat accounts. See, it's disgusting. See, I've done it again there. I said it's disgusting, but maybe they were maybe they were breaking the law. Maybe the act of freezing their assets was, or their fiat bank accounts was, actually uh, lawful in some way. But it doesn't mention that in the article. I'm just saying. I have to be careful as a um, crypto enthusiast not to automatically um, subscribe to that narrative that says all the existing financial institutions are corrupt and evil and they want to kill us all and so like that. Some of them do, but it's not all of them. Um, and jumping to that conclusion automatically, that's prejudice. So I have to be careful about that. Alrighty then, let's move on. Quick update on the old Bitfinex situation. This article on Coindesk, written by Stan Higgins, it's entitled Bitfinex offers $3.6 million in a bounty to recover stolen Bitcoin from the hack, right? So they're saying anyone who can help us get back the, whatever it was, 120,000 Bitcoin in the recent incident, we'll give you 5% of that as a reward, which is about 6,000 Bitcoins or about six point, sorry, $3.6 million at the current market price. And it says this news came out on social media today in a post by Bitfinex community director Zane Tackett. And it was in response to a question about the existence of such a program. He stated that a bounty would be awarded to anyone who had information that helped the exchange recover the funds, which is interesting. Isn't it? And also Bitfinex resumed trading earlier today, just over one week after it shut down after the theft from the hack. And finally, before we close today, there's another article here on Coindesk about Bitfinex, and it's entitled Bitfinex Draws Volume as Traders Test Experimental BFX Tokens. So Bitfinex is back up and running again, and it says mark, the mark, a market appears to be developing for Bitfinex's newly issued debt tokens. Distributed this week by the troubled exchange to users who lost funds in last week's $60 million hack, the value of the cryptographic tokens rose sharply after the exchange, exchange resumes trading today. The so-called BFX tokens, a debt-based blockchain asset said to be convertible to equity in the Hong Kong-based business, stated the day stated the day out or started the day out at uh, ten cents each, and rose to as much as forty cents over the course of the day's session. This sharp price appreciation proved the most interesting development associated with Bitfinex and their widely anticipated reopening, according to analysts. Arthur Hayes, the CEO of leveraged trading platform BitMEX, noted his interest in the strength of the market for the new coin, as others questioned why traders were returning to the exchange at all. So Hayes told Coindesk, quote, Even though Bitfinex explicitly said it has no obligation to ever pay back a dime to Bit." BFX token holders, traders still ascribe a healthy value to the token. Close quote. That's what I wondered. I'm like, if that's true, if if these IOUs aren't actually uh, there's no obligation to pay back what the the IOU is owed, well then, what's their value? I, I don't really know. The exchange revealed on the sixth of August that these tokens would be available for trade until Bitfinex either pays back its account holders or provides them with shares in iFinex, the BVI-based parent company of the exchange. And Bitfinex data reveals that the two currency pairs involving the token, which is BFX against the US dollar and BFX against Bitcoin, generated far greater volume than any other currency pairs between the exchange's reopening at 4 p.m., universal uh, time and the time of the report. BitMEX went so far as to launch a new features con a futures contract called BFX Q16, which allows traders to speculate 
on BFX against the US dollar's price and the movements with as much as two and a half times leverage. In spite of the token's strong price appreciation and robust transaction volume, market responses were mixed. Some emphasized that by issuing the new tokens, Bitfinex was dis distributing the first debt-based cryptocurrency, which triggered fears that the community was perhaps turning its back on earlier ideas or ideals. Other market observers, including Whale Club's Director of Operations, Peter Ziv Zivkovsky, voiced concerns that the market was being driven by Bitfinex staff members as a means to buy back this equity at a lower price. At press time, no other exchange has announced support for the digital asset. Yes, well, that's the key bit for me there, where it says, in spite of the token's strong price appreciation and robust transaction volume, market responses were mixed. Some emphasized that by issuing the new tokens, here it is, Bitfinex was distributing the first debt-based cryptocurrency, which triggered fears that the community was perhaps turning its back on earlier ideals. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. A debt-based or debt-backed cryptocurrency is little better than a debt-backed fiat currency paper money system. The whole point, I thought, of cryptocurrencies was that it gave sovereign control of the money to the to the person who owned it legally, um, and that the value was it was held within the token itself, and the value went wherever the token went. So it was a cash-based system. I mean, Bitcoin, the original scientific paper, I think it was even entitled Bitcoin Digital uh, Cash System. And, and cash is debtless by default. There is no debt in a cash-based system, right? The only debt would be a counterfeit, you know what I mean? If you issue more money, then, then it's actually in circulation. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an old uh, fiat legacy idea, the idea of a debt-backed cryptocurrency, um, which I, just, I think that's got what's got us into the mess that we're in. And there's a lot of debt-backed assets in the world and in the derivatives market that are going to play a significant role in the next financial crash. So I, I, I personally was, me, I would never invest my money in a, in a debt backed cryptocurrency. If I wanted debt backed assets, I would buy them in the fiat currency world. Or if I wanted debt, I'll just lend my Bitcoins out on a peer to peer lending platform or something like that. You know, may as well own the debt myself. Anyway, that's going to do it for today's edition of the Cryptoverse with me, Chris Coney. I would like to thank you very much for listening today. Please go to the podcast page on Cryptoversity, sign up on your favorite platform, click through to Steam it, vote for this episode to support us financially. Or if you want to send us a tip via Bitcoin, there's a Bitcoin address on the podcast page for you to be able to do that. All right, guys, until tomorrow, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.